Hello and welcome to The Bat. This is episode 42. Apparently, the answer to life, the universe and everything, according to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is for the 14th of February, 2016. Valentine's Day. The celebratory day, whose name we shall not mention, even though Dino just did. did. My bad. Because I consider it a conspiracy by Hallmark. Is it a conspiracy? No, a conspiracy to conspiracy get implies money out of my wallet. People I, like it are I think involved. it's been fairly well documented, hasn't it? it it's pretty just, public as well. It's not, no one's trying to hide yeah. anything. It's just created as a consumer holiday or mm. whatever they want to call it. Anyone got any romantic stories today? I've just realized that I... Uh, well, I have a, one that I could maybe rewrite on the fly to be a little romantic, but the rest of them not so much. No. No. Nothing. Okay, well, that's good. It's good. We're really on target today. Yeah. And we are also broadcasting from the progressive bubble, where on this day in 1966, Australia decimalised its currency. That was a nod for common sense. Who's left with non-decimalised currency now? America, America and I believe... No, I don't know. They've decimalised their currency because quarters are 25 cents. No one's using the pound. No, they haven't. Yeah, they haven't decimalised their um, weights. Wait, I like yeah. how we both went America. Like we both, yeah, America. We just assumed. we had America. We're well, going they'd America. be stupid. Yeah. They they wouldn't. Surely they wouldn't. They still Someone would have fought feet back. Feet and inches, yeah. and obviously their currency is equally as they're messed up. Shi- <laughs> they decided to start using shillings just to stick it out, stick it to it. Yeah. No, it's I mean, in Zimbabwe have got no currency of their own. They use other people's currency, so I guess yeah. you could say theirs isn't decimalized. Oh yeah, they use the one and the uh, American dollar, don't they? They do. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any douchebag news? I for one do. I um news, I bit... news of douchebags? No, no, that's a different I, I douchebag could as regularly uh, as a television writer have been corrected. Uh, Sorry, Martin douche... does not count as douchebag news. I still think he does. <laughs> Sorry, I, I did mean douchebag filter. Um, there, there is plenty of time for douchebag news. I think our whole show is about douchebags. Um, today it is. But um, I was a bit late to the game. I watched uh, a movie from I think it was 2011 called Driver. I thought Star- it was going to be the game. No, uh, <laughs> which is a great um, film. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, with especially since it's Valentine's Day, it's worth talking about Ryan Gosling. You know, every woman's heartthrob and Valentine's hey, dream. He was hired for uh, the Notebook because he was atypically looking, like he was not a typical handsome man. Yeah, he's, it's he's, just a bit of random history I have about the film. Yeah, um, but yeah, I felt um, that Driver was a significant nod to film noir and the hard-boiled genre. I've never seen it. I, I avoided it for a long time. I, I thought, is this just a driving movie? But it. It is a bit more. It's very stylized. Um, it got a lot of. Um, Does it plaudits. feature a character named Miss Daisy? No, no, no. Unfortunately, it's a shame. not. Shame. Um, it won a lot of applause at the Cannes Film Festival. It was originally scheduled to be released as a blockbuster, but then was reassigned as an independent film. I've seen it, and it, I just don't have much memory of it at all. How can you reassign it as an independent film? Like, if it's got a big studio backing it. <laughs> and Ryan Gosling as a star you're like oh no, this, this no, is they, a, nothing to see here it's not a blockbuster you don't understand they've got, a, they've got a brand called independent film oh right yeah okay <laughs> uh, I think owned, real- owned by MGM <laughs> <laughs> I think they realised um, through testing audiences that it wasn't really going to appeal to yeah. mainstream audiences he blocks so all the busters it, and you can't over publicise a movie like that otherwise people would be pissed yeah yeah I mean if you, if you come to that movie realising that sort of a nod to film noir and Hardball detectives and so forth. You get a lot of enjoyment from it, but if it was, you know, uh, you know, advertised as some, a if, Ryan Gosling vehicle, if the Fast and the Furious crew were heading in to watch Driver, yeah, and they're not coming out happy. No, no. Well, I mean, for a movie, come that's on, called... they're idiots though. They're coming out happy. <laughs> no, no, that's what I mean. Well, for <laughs> a movie that's called Driver, there's not that much driving in it actually, to be honest. Is he a mechanic and it's he's talking about screwdrivers? Or... <laughs> well, it's a bit of that. A bit of that. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't really talk much at all, does he? That well, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I think he's got. A few, uh, only a few lines. Or a one That's how you get Ryan Gosling on a shoestring budget. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be playing a mute, a very stoic man. You don't say that. So, you appear on the screen and look pretty. So, has anyone else been watching anything this week? No, the, the expanse is finished. It's done its 10 episodes. I haven't watched it. It's in high I haven't watched the second one yet. I, I'm, I'm, I'm on episode one. And, uh, and I don't really have anything new. And Shannara's sort of. What's Shannara? You've mentioned this before. Have it's I asked a, this it's question fantasy. Before? It's, it's, uh, oh, you, I did ask this before. It's, yep. Dungeons and Dragons. It's a bunch of books kind of that got made into a TV, into a series. TV series. And I get very nervous and as when I make fantasy And as TV I said, series. I think I was explaining to you, it's it's kind of cheesy. It's kind of corny, but, you know, all fantasy kind of is. Hmm. So it's... Very heavily troped. Yeah, but actually for the for the kind of... I don't know what kind of budget they have, but they've got pretty good digital effects and they've, they've gone to some... Well, do they have enough to pay Ryan Gosling to stoically stand yeah, around? No. no, they've got some... 
vaguely recognizable B grade actors that you've probably noticed in other background of other shows. Okay, yeah, I will. I will check it out. I will check it out. Uh, and if you read the books, you've never read the books, the Shannara books. I think I have. Sort of Shannara and all that kind of. When I was a younger lad. Yeah, they, they were they were a long way back. Anyway, it's Dungeons and Dragons on the small screen. Nothing not to love about that. Yeah, I remember we've talked about this in the show because I asked about is there a Wayans brother. I was about to make a no, joke I right. know I've already made before. <laughs> well, we should uh, move along into short, fast news then. Um, I have T-Bone news. It's been a while, but I always love T-Bone news. Is it, is it a Kissinger story? <laughs> no, but I do oh, think we, we could have had two T-Bone that. stories then. <laughs> um, I mean, when isn't Prime Minister Tony Abbott... Eh, sorry, Ex-Prime Minister. Ex-Prime Minister Tony Abbott getting himself into the news. But we shall revisit the Kissinger stuff because I think that's an important note. But... I'd, um, there was something else I wanted to mention that came up in the news about T-Bone. Everyone's lovable meddling backbencher, former PM and all-time douchebag, uh, has been given approval from Malcolm Daddy Warbucks Turnbull for two additional staff. When he was ousted from office, he was given the standard MP entitlement of a ground floor backbencher suite in the Parliament House and four staff. However, the details of the September 29th approval which were revealed in answers to the Senate estimate, uh, estimates uh, question on notice released this week that he was given an extra two staff to be employed for no longer than 12 months, uh, an assistant advisor to support Mr Abbott in his role as former Prime Minister. What, what are these extra two staff doing for him? Well, hooking up interviews, uh, meetings with Henry Kissinger for a start. Uh-huh. There's that, obviously. Possibly. Also, Tony is one of those kind of guys who does probably need an assistant and an advisor. Because when he opens his mouth, he either fills it with an onion or he says something stupid. <laughs> well, the like, thing he is, needs minders. We need to get that man some more onions. We do. <laughs> that would <laughs> just solve a lot of problems. He's actually trying to tap into his um, former prime minister entitlements, but he's still an acting backbencher. So mm. he's trying to, you know, double dip. Now here's the man who's a uh, like toy boy dip. treasurer. Said it was the end of the age of entitlements. Apparently, Tony wasn't listening to that call from uh, Joe. And, and, and I think the um, the wonky guys were talking about this. They said, well, that's an entitlement you get when you leave Parliament. Mm. So Malcolm Turnbull should have said, look, you can get that entitlement when you leave, Tony. You know what, though? Feel Malcolm free to leave any time, Tony. He would have loved the fact that Tony came to him and had to ask more stuff, though. Why I beat you on the field of battle, and now you have to come to me and ask for more stuff. You know what, Tony? You can have as many stuff as you want. Because huh. you're the former PM. I'm not sure the PM's acting like he's a particularly strong sort of... Well, I mean, this decision position. was made shortly after um, the ousting of Tony yeah. Abbott, so it's probably the uh, to smooth the waters, which were never really smoothed, in, as we've seen. That was back when Tony wasn't going to be sniping from the exactly. sidelines. Well, when he said he wouldn't, he probably yeah. had no intentions. As I naively believed at the time, Tony's not that kind of guy. I'm wrong. We always give him one chance, don't we, Dean? Oh, look, you got to have best expectations. Yeah. I thought he would go quietly into the night. I didn't think he'd stick around either. He's running a partisan campaign in the I foothills. Mean, I was I hadn't really given it much thought, but I'm not terribly surprised that he's stuck around. I mean, he's doing what he does best and what he knows. And that's just gutter politics kind of thing. That's what he does. Mm. If he could get he's his hands good. on a, a junket of a position that had a nice, fat, <clears throat> juicy uh, pay packet that would think be he's just gonna, entitled for the next 20 years, he would have gone for that. Is he no, just going to troll, the, just no. gonna troll the Liberal Party until he can get one of those roles? Why? you, you, you got to remember, what kind of private company is going to want to have Tony as their face, the figurehead? CEO Tony Abbott shares... <laughs> yeah. I mean, and he's relatively young, so... You know, and he's not a, a wealthy man by well, any means. I think we have our answer. It's far right Christian, Christian anti gay groups in America that, that really have his back, don't they? They they're the ones, love him. They're the ones paying for him to fly over and bring the family on a junket. That's, that's the closest thing he's had. Look, if they're spending their money to bring Tony out, they're harassing less people, I guess. No one's going to come out and see him. <laughs> that's right. Like you, you go, oh, a special speaker, Tony Abbott. People will stay home. <clears throat> it's hopefully putting money back into the economy at no net loss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An asshole gets to talk to other assholes. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. You just get assholes together in it's, a room. They cancel each other out. It's fine. I wish that's how it worked. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, and Donald Trump's proving that isn't how it works. No. Is it? It's really not, is it? He's They'll amplify. Yeah. Yeah. Now you did mention earlier a name that sends shivers down my spine. I, I consider him a war criminal. Henry Kissinger. Uh, Henry Kissinger. His Hillary Clinton did... doesn't. No. She had a photo with him this week as well. No. And it was good to see that um, because in the last two debates, she's used um, Henry Kissinger as a character reference for her own abilities. Um, The first time, uh, Bernie let that slide, but this time around, he called her out on it and said um, that (coughs) I'm no friend of Henry Kissinger. I I consider him a... 
Well, he didn't say war criminal, but he said his actions. He, one of the most Cambodia, yeah. secretaries of state in American mm. modern American history is what he said, um, and and quite rightly so. I mean, Kissinger was the the architect of Cambodia that allowed the Khmer Rouge to come in and kill three million people. He was also the architect of the um, uh, gut regime change in Chile, the the coup down there. I mean, that was Kissinger's work as well. Um, uh, apparently, like there's the number of deaths res- attributed to Henry Kissinger's decisions can be to- he's one of the biggest, largest mass murderers in the world, or something like that. So it, it's it's not even particularly contentious. I mean, it, it seems like in American politics, it, they're always playing rather nice and being very polite around Henry, Henry Kissinger as some kind of elder statesman. But it, it, this is one of the first times in a massive public forum where his actions are being called out. It's, mm-hmm. it's a it's a good step. It's yeah. a fantastic. It's step. a much needed step as well, like facing up to your own history, something America doesn't really do. What I I've, what I find about because I was going to talk a little bit about this the, anyway, but um, what I find interesting about this is one of the things that um, in the in the American primaries that are being held up is Hillary Clinton's foreign uh, foreign policy experience because she was Secretary of State. Mm. She's got exper- she got experience dealing with foreign leaders. What this goes to show is that she may have experience, but she may not have the judgment that people want because. Her advisors is Henry, Kiss- is Henry Kissinger. She's been involved in, and been happy to facilitate regime change as a, as a policy in, on behalf of America throughout most of her history as Secretary of State, even before that, as the Clintons as well. So this is kind of a, showing what kind of foreign policy, what a foreign policy under Hillary Clinton would be like. So more of the same. More of the same, yeah, which nobody's particularly happy with. That's Trump supporters certainly aren't. So more of the same against Bernie Sanders saying, "Well, I'm certainly not going with Henry Kissinger." So, well, has there been any backlash to Bernie um, calling out on <coughs> Henry Kissinger? Not as yet. It's it's. Uh, There's probably a lot of young Americans going, "Who?" Yeah, yeah and, and that that's the, so the establishment are trying to throw it away and say he's a friendly who, old so nobody even remembers who the hell Henry yeah. Kissinger is. However, on the left, he's fairly well known. I mean, he's been written about fairly extensively and well, stuff like that so the, the reason i asked that is because i'm wondering if hillary will keep on trundling out his name now now that she's been called out on it once did yeah. did, did the mainstream democrats see that as a oh you've been called out you can't use that anymore no i mean it'd be interesting but i don't think it's it's going to count against uh it, it's certainly on brand for bernie attacking henry kissinger he's not losing any followers He's possibly only going to gain people when they realise that hey, he's actually coming and he's going to call out things like this, which is well, quite people plainly, seem to Henry. Google the things he says as well. Yeah, they, so Hillary, you could definitely cost Hillary, even if it doesn't help Bernie directly. Um, I guess I don't know what it was. I mean, thinking back to two thousand and eight and how readily available information was and whether it was searched that way, I don't know. But certainly this this time around, even there's online tools tracking what people are searching during hmm. debates and things like that, which turn up interesting sort of results. Now, the other thing we should mention is. T-Bone, he's got six staff. Oh. These staff could have sort of maybe given a hint to him that you want to keep that uh, visit with hang on, Kissinger hang on. a bit secret. Henry Kissinger's probably got six staff and they probably should have said, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> maybe you want to keep this visit from Tony Abbott a little bit secret. It goes two ways because Tony's he's a little toxic. <laughs> Is this a case of the two most toxic people around? Yeah. Both going like, staff- well, what, both going, well, what have we got to lose? Yeah, their staff are <laughs> probably like, well, if we put two arseholes in a room, it's a net... <laughs> Lot, and there's no net loss, right? It's fine. It just yeah. don't worry about it. Uh, they cancel each other out. Yeah, they right. cancel each other out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I Two negatives make a positive. I can't believe that I'm going to say this, but I don't even think Tony Abbs is toxic of the same toxic level as Henry Kissinger. But he's current toxic. <laughs> Kissinger's like historically toxic. But it's a bit yeah. weak source toxi- toxicity that Abbott brings. Well, yeah. he was incompetently toxic. Yeah, is what it was. Aggressively <laughs> incompetent though. Like he really got in your face with his incompetence. He doesn't really have much of a kill count though. That's a shame, isn't it? I bet yeah. he'd he be sad about that. He probably <laughs> was talking to Kissinger. Just wish I had killed more people, Henry. A couple of good regime changes, you know? <laughs> well, you had a bit of a regime change, didn't you, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> I did not help with that. <laughs> Speaking of elder statesmen, uh, Philip Ruddock has announced his retirement from Australian politics. Uh, you may be aware that he, he's a 72-year-old gentleman. He is the longest standing member in our uh, current House of Reps. Second longest standing politician of Australian history, uh, the longest standing being Billy Hughes, our seventh uh, PM, stuck around, changing parties like a madman. Um, <laughs> he's a man who oversaw an extension of mandatory detention for unauthorised arrivals, which I probably should add was a Keating government policy to begin with that the Liberals under Howard just made worse. 
uh, a man who is uh, was well regarded, well regarded, not well regarded, was well known as the mastermind of the Pacific Solution. A man who oversaw the introduction of temporary protection visas to prevent refugees from staying in our country permanently. Policy widely regarded as a violation of human rights. Was um, he was he minister when Tampa? Yes, he yeah. was. He was. Yeah. A very central figure in the Tampa, but oh, wow. uh, we digress. We'll come we, we, back. Well, look, we, we'll come that, that A man, you know, central he's a man. figure Tampa. Fine. I, I have a list and you're jumping ahead. Sorry. A but man who was asked by Amnesty International to please stop wearing <laughs> their lapel pin. <laughs> a, a lapel pin, which you can freely wear as an individual. Freely wear as an individual. Philip Ruddock cannot wear. <laughs> instance, they've politely tapped a minister on the show and said, oh, please don't. A man who introduced the marriage legislation amendment bill to prevent court rulings from having influence over same-sex marriages or civil unions this man this man is being put forward as a special envoy to the united nations human rights council his mission is to get australia a seat on that council a council i should add is currently chaired by the kingdom of saudi arabia wonderful People with a deep understanding of human rights and how to violate them. Philip's going to get along well with these people. That's some that's some company you want to be in with, isn't it? Well, Philip Ruddock would. You know, if he knows how to violate human rights, they know how to view, violate human rights. Case, Let's make this thing a big joke. Is this a case where Philip Ruddock may have been doing less damage in his role as a minister instead? I don't know. No? I don't know. I don't he know. wanted to. He was seeking to reintroduce temporary protection visas <laughs> for refugees. Like that, which you know, look, fine. They're getting a visa and they're getting to come here and they're they're getting some protection. They're not being uh, held in rape camps, which maybe is a good thing. I don't think it's as good as we can do, and I think our country is better than that. But it's certainly better than rape camp. Um, anyway, that's not even as crazy as this week gets in Australian politics. Well, well before we move on there, I, there's one comment I wanted to mention about Ruddick. Now, Ruddick, he's, he's not a stupid person by any means. He's a pretty smart operator. He is, yeah. Now. It's pretty clear to everybody that he was... This this scenario is him being bumped up the stairs, as they say, to free up his very safe seat. They, they very, want him to move safe. on. So he would have been... You'd imagine he would have been able to negotiate where he went to. And surely someone as shrewd as Ruddick would have seen, especially invited to the United Nations, no one's going to buy that. Come on. Seriously, maybe once he's the pelvic back. You want to go in public and say, "I'm the special envoy yeah, for but, human but rights." This is this is the this is the council where Saudi Arabia is chairing it. People might buy it. I they actually, bought Saudi Arabia. I actually think that Philip Ruddock, <laughs> honest, genuinely believes that he's doing the right thing. He like he would wear that amnesty pin even when all that horrible shit was happening. He would wear that because he thought he was doing the right thing and he was defending human rights. He honestly is passionate about this. He's just clueless. The, the well-known phenomenon of being blinded by hubris. Mm. That's what I think is going on with him. I don't know. I think this might have been his position he negotiated. Everyone's like, are you sure? Are you sure this is what it's going to take? Because this seems like a bad deal for us. Even Tony's new special um, uh, advisors are saying you shouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my second piece uh, of short, fast news for this week, uh, also Australian politics themed, uh, Greg Hunt, our environment minister, was given an award this week. There was a ceremony held in the UAE that describes itself as the primary global forum dedicated to shaping the future of government worldwide. What was that award, you ask? Fairest and best for the under-11s. Wow. <laughs> Almost. He was named the best minister in the world. Now, I like to imagine his feelings went a little bit like this. So that's an R. Kelly clip <laughs> For anyone out there who is a fan of uh, Chocolate Factory as an album uh, You will recognise that song But let's just hold on a second This man is a, is a first time minister And, and in his uh, well golden couple of years He's outlasted Tony uh, He's overseen <laughs> the first rise in carbon emissions In almost a decade As an environment minister He, uh, he was personally responsible for shutting down the Climate Commission Which for those of you who aren't aware is a federal government funded body established to provide the Australian public with information about climate change. Climate change. We don't do that anymore. People don't get in information thanks to Greg Hunt. Uh, he also approved the dumping of the dredge seabed from Abbott Point Coalport inside the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park as Environment Minister. He's the best minister in the world. Looking at that list, I can see why <laughs> they awarded him such a title. 
He's not really the best environment minister in the world, but if you're looking at it from a certain perspective, he's certainly, he's, his arm's easily bent. If you want something done and you're a big company, maybe you mine coal, he'll let it happen. I want to know the shortlist for that uh, award. Well, it's interesting because uh, the shortlist was put together by uh, Thompson Reuters, who actually suggested this uh, award as well. Now, I don't have the shortlist, but shortly after Greg Hunt was announced as the winner, they backed away from this and they say <laughs> they had no knowledge that he was being awarded. They merely suggested the award. They provided a list of 100 people. It was whittled down to 10 and somehow Greg Hunt won. They were, they were pretty much throwing their hands in the air and saying, we were just administering this. Yeah. This is not our idea. We were just administering this. We did not suggest he should win. It's funny, I did a bit of research during the week on this um, World's Best Minister Award because, for instance, I looked for the 2015 World's Best Minister. Well, could it's not 2016. Find one. This, is, yeah. <laughs> this is the first time. I could not find... And any, perhaps the only time this award is ever given. Any Correct. list of the 100 nominees? No. Any information of who nominated them? No, no, Greg Hunt just won. I'm wondering <laughs> if it's like an honour certificate thing where, you know, next year... It's a participation The Peter award. Dutton of Liechtenstein will win. You, you have to wonder, is, is. is um, World's Best Minister, Greg Hunt, going to be making any important decisions that might uh, have uh, an impact on the Middle East to some extent? I don't know. Maybe maybe they want to do some investment. Mm. I, it could be that it's uh, merely blowing some smoke up his uh, posterior <laughs> in an attempt to uh, get some better deals. I think you could just bribe him. I'm not saying he's bribable, but come on. World's Best Minister... <laughs> I think the best thing about this award is no one's taking it seriously. <laughs> I wonder if he's got it on his wall. You know how people, people frame things and hang it up? Do you reckon it's hung up? I wonder if he is taking it seriously. Well, uh, Dean and myself had a conversation about this earlier on and we, we sort of uh, supposed that it, okay. even the most reasonably intelligent person would say, this award is a trap. <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing good about this award. I accept it. I look like I'm full of hubris. If I decline it, I look... Yeah, like I don't respect this council of government excellence. Well, yeah, I'm thumbing my nose at our important trade partners in the yeah. Middle East. This is really a no-win situation. You have to go and accept it. You have to go with, my wife still expects me to take the rubbish out yeah. angle, which is uh, apparently he's what diminishing, he's, he's diminishing it a little bit, yeah. Tongue-in-cheek, this award may not be all it's cracked up. Today. I look forward to 2017. I want to see who wins it next. Okay, so we're going to step back to uh, Bernie Sanders again because this is my favourite subject at the moment. It, you uh, are feeling the burn. I make this joke uh, every I'm week. I'm feeling the burn, and but not only that, American politics is the greatest reality show on, t- on TV at the moment. Greg Hunt wherever. just won Best Minister in the World. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I played R. Kelly. Yeah. Australian, Australian. He likes poli- to piss on people. Australian politics is like the minor league. Underage people, and, allegedly. And, and American politics is, is clearly the show. And that's the, it's just amazing. It's amazing. you got Trump... Who could, which Australian politician can I see can your long Trump? form birth certificate, please? <laughs> <laughs> which Australian politician can compete with Trump? Uh, Pauline Hanson. No. Uh, no. Ricky, Ricky Muir. Ricky Jesus. Muir. I could put Ricky Muir in a room with Donald Trump. Low energy. Low, low energy. energy. He's a loser. He's a loser. He's a. He's it's true. A, it's true. He is. In terms, <laughs> <laughs> I've heard other people say it. In, in terms, it's not of, me saying it. It's other people. It's other yeah. people saying it. Anyway, anyway. So I've been paying a lot of attention to it, and, and just this last week. We had the second uh, second primary, well, the, sorry, the first primary, the second state to actually uh, adjudicate who's going to be the uh, Republican and Democrat nominees, and uh, there was the usual shit show on the Republican side with Trump emerging massively triumphant <laughs> after uh, Rubio bot shut down. Well, yes, I mean this is what this is why it's the greatest show. So many crazy things. You got Rubio bot. This guy gets busted just. Repeating a 20 sec, 25 second macro of a speech over and over and over. And he kept doing it though. And he can't stop. He simply cannot <laughs> He just stop. couldn't stop. And the fat man called him on it. Chris Christie. <laughs> and then he did it again. And then he repeated himself again. One of the most despicable men in American politics <laughs> called him on it. I like how Chris <laughs> Christie totally still him. finished sixth. He finished <laughs> yeah. below Rubio bot. Yeah. Like it didn't help him. <laughs> so anyway, Rubio down. Trump, Trump trounced them all and then the rest finished in a, in a, a mixed crowd of within about five percentage points. Cash did well. Cash Oh. Kasich came in second. That's better. Your pronunciation is way Kasich better. Kasich came in second. Kasich, Kasich yeah. Kasich, yeah. And, but um, with like half the votes <clears throat> Trump got. Exactly. And he's yeah. running a clean campaign. Like he's not, he's not negging well, anyone. Some would say he's not running much of a campaign at all. Why well, called so, Trump a clean campaign? No, he otherwise. still beat Jeb Bush, who is running no, a campaign. No, Jeb <laughs> Bush is a disaster. <laughs> but um, but Kasich is interesting because he's, he's fairly moderate. People are thinking maybe he's the guy that the establishment can get behind because they simply cannot get behind Trump. 
But anyway, Trump's Trump's going on. He's going forward, and, and he's he's looking pretty powerful at the moment. And if the next, if he comes, does well in the next primary, he, he may well be unstoppable. This this monstrosity may be unstoppable. But then on the other side, you had Sanders and Clinton. So Clinton got absolutely trounced in this, which is just the, the largest winning margin of any uh, North, uh, New Hampshire primary. And it's just stunned the the mainstream media and the sort of political establishment over there because they just could not accept that Sanders was going to be coming this coming this strong, and he's been raising incredible amounts of money. But anyway, so. They're now moving on to the next the next couple of states in the next week. That's Nevada and South Carolina. That's right. So Nevada next for the Democrats and South Carolina for uh, for the for uh, the Republicans. Um, but the other the other sort of twist in this uh, in the in the politics at the moment is that Anthony Scalia just died. So one of the Supreme Court justices, one of the most conservative of the Supreme Court justices, just recently died. This now puts in play as to whether the the current president chooses the, a new uh, Supreme Court justice or the next president does. So the stakes have possibly raised for the presidency again. And this means that you could have Trump selecting a Supreme Court justice. Wait, well, he'd pick a 10 out of 10, <laughs> obviously. Oh, he'd be amazing. He'd be great. He wouldn't be a loser. He would not be a loser. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> Trust me, it'd be the most luxurious <laughs> Supreme Court justice you can imagine. Or, and this must really scare the establishment, it could be Sanders picking that that, that uh, Supreme Court justice. Which I just find it, it's fascinating. Or it's Obama. Fascinating. Or Obama. Or Obama, which he says he's going to... I mean, the, the Republicans are saying he should wait. He's saying, no, he's going to do his constitutional duty and appoint. The, the Republicans, of course, could possibly stymie him for the remainder of his term. So that's it, it may be forced upon him that he can't actually get this. They could probably hold out for eight months. I don't know what damage this does to them in the in the in the election process. It could be could be fatal. It may not affect. Well, them if all. Trump gets a nomination, though, they might be like, it doesn't matter. But anyway, and the it reason this is stop, so important, of course, Sanders is because uh, um, when, when an, uh, uh, very rarely do you get a presidency where there's an immediate time where you might be doing a Supreme Court justice, and this is kind of important because so uh, for the last few decades. Four decades, actually, it's been yeah. stacked in the Conservatives. Yeah, favor. so it's been always at least 5-4 in favour of the Conservatives, and this could potentially move it. And this is with um, important climate legislation, uh, bank regulation sort of legislation coming up as well. A revisit of Citizens, Citizens United. United. And if You know who might make a good Supreme Court justice if Hillary gets elected? Henry Kissinger. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's her friend it's her friend he's a great guy he's a great guy there are a lot of names being thrown around um, but anyway the ones we, we want to hear would be Elizabeth Warren or Lawrence Lessig <laughs> which we've already talked about um, not on the show <laughs> <laughs> and they laughed uproariously but <laughs> <laughs> you're living in Fairyland <laughs> however Elizabeth Warren I mean arguably she could be running for president right now and probably walking she, to the job she, arguably she should be like she'd be great yeah. she's just chosen not to she's not interested uh, well, she's doing a good job where she is. Yeah, well, I like that about her. She's like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm succeeding and I'm, I'm doing really well here. It would have also been very difficult to go against the Hillary machine. Uh, Bernie's proven otherwise. They didn't know that when they got in, when Bernie was getting into the race. Even Bernie was really just... Uh, his, the initial thing was, we're going to be building a movement. We want to start... We want to make sure there's dialogue happening from the left. I don't. I think. Well, all credit to them. Maybe, maybe they aren't so surprised by their success, but I think they. Just about everyone is. I think people generally want change. Though you present two corporatist candidates year after year, and people are like, "No, no, I want something else." Which is why Trump is so popular as well. Well, this because he's something else. This seems to be an example of what happens when you get genuine choice in the process. Because up until the point you've just had establishment candidates, and people are yeah, it's fairly lackluster. The no other thing really to cares. bear in mind, though, is that um, New Hampshire it wasn't a true test of um, Bernie's um, approval rate because it was foretold that he would win New Hampshire. Well, I mean, he'd been polling well there for a while, yeah. but, the, but then you've got, to look at the, you've got to look at more granular the results. I mean, he won over 85% of independent voters. He brought in more voters like independents. Like, these are the voters that everyone wants to get in the general election. He's proving himself to be very electable. But it's still a state that's mainly white, so he hasn't really yeah. had to test himself but in minority populations. Hillary's yeah, quite white. It's interesting, but she's also <laughs> quite white. And and they're always banking on Hillary having the black vote in the southern states locked up. And I don't think well, that's such a sure thing. Well, this is why Nevada is going to be the real test. Yeah. If there's been any sort of shift in minority voters' um, opinion yeah. of Bernie versus uh, Hillary. And then uh, Bernie did win every demographic. Uh, of except white people. For, uh, over every, no, every demographic people comes within, within there right? except for families earning over $200,000. Hmm. And people over 65 or something like that. But every other Democrat, women, uh, even Democrats he edged her out in. 
Um, but the big thing was those independent voters, which is what both parties want, because that's the vote you need to turn out to win. Mm. So, I mean, it's his electability question seems to be getting answered. But well, as you said, the next one's the big test. In but New the, Hampshire. Yeah. Yes. Actually, and, no, no. <laughs> no, in, in, Nevada in Nevada and then South Carolina. But then these are two states he can go through. The big thing after that is Super Tuesday, where they have 12 states all at once. That's on March 2nd, I think, or something the, like that. The other thing that which um, Sam said from the Majority Report has mentioned quite a few times is that, uh, and everyone says Hillary's got the um, minority vote locked up, the Latinos and the black Yeah, vote. I don't think that's But the other right. thing is that if they may be just disenchanted and might not turn up to vote. Exactly, exactly. So if she's not offering them any real anything real from a policy perspective, they might not show they up. They might not vote for Bernie, but they may not turn up for her exactly. either. Exactly. Yeah. So Bernie might not have to win That's them. That's why they're always claiming. I mean, you look at her campaign and just how lacklustre it's been. And mm. they've always, it's always been assumed that these southern states are just going to roll in with the, with the Clintons. And in such a, in a, in a political, in an atmosphere, an election atmosphere where everyone's so anti-establishment, I don't think you can make that assumption. It's well, it didn't just, work for Jeb Bush either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's basically the Hillary Clinton of the right. I don't know if you saw, I, I saw some clips from the last night's um, debate. They might be worth watching Trump. Trump is just savaging these people. <laughs> he's just calling them liar to their face. And, uh, and basically the, the, the um, debate hall is filled up with lobbyists mm. and special interest groups. And they're all booing him and he's attacking the crowd. It's crazy. The I'm going to have to watch this now. <laughs> I, I saw an excellent um, presidential campaign speech by Trump. I, I don't know where it was. I saw this on Facebook where he's addressing the crowd and he's talking about how he's being challenged about how he's going to build the wall yeah. and make Mexico pay for it. You know, he's saying, you know, I'm going to build a wall. And he's saying to the crowd, who's going to pay for it? And the ch- crowd cheers back, Mexico. <laughs> and, and he's saying how this um, reporter's asking him, how are you going to make them do it? And he says, you know what I told him? The wall just got 10 feet higher and the crowd was like, <laughs> <rocks> enjoyed. <laughs> so in none of that did he address how Mexico, how he's going to make Mexico pay for it. But, it, you know, that sleight of hand was amazing. He's, yeah. I, mean, he's I might a, see that go on, though, until the wall's like, you know, 50,000 feet high <laughs> and Mexico still doesn't pay for it. I mean, the, the politics, especially on the Republican side, it's just become a show and he's a showman. This oh, is definitely. his game. It, also, <laughs> going back to when he attacked a crowd full of lobbyists, that's actually playing to his core demographic they as love well. It. They would have loved the that. People on the TV who are watching it love it. People in the audience who he doesn't give a shit about, they're yeah. booing him. He doesn't care about that. Well, his base, and that just feeds into his... <laughs> yeah, and it makes him look like the kind of guy who will stand up to lobbyists and special interest groups because he's doing that right now, yeah. which is exactly what the, his, no, his core demographic wants. As I said, it's, it's, one of the most, it's the most compelling TV I've got. He's, well, he's a shrewd campaign because his base don't care for the details. They don't want nuanced explanation on how he's going to convince Mexico to pay for this wall. They're not interested in it at all. Yeah, which is good. Uh, he's certainly found his people. Which he's is going to be interesting people. when it's the Bernie Trump matchup. You've got one side not interested in details, and Bernie's there, they've been pressing him for details. They want to make sure he can implement his, his plans, but they're not asking any questions, the Republican guys. It will be an interesting debate. If it comes down to Trump versus Bernie, every yeah. debate. Yeah, everyone goes with Bernie, Bernie and Trump. I, I don't things. think you can be so certain about that. Yeah. Trump could just come in and just flick him off. That's it. Yeah. Bernie will ask Trump to explain things. He goes, the water's got 10 feet higher. Crap goes wild. Boo details. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's what's been keeping me sort of occupied is, tr- is tracking, this, tracking the primary season. It's, it's got ages to go yet. This thing goes on forever. There was one uh, point of contention that, that uh, one sort of flaw in the, the Bernie Sanders platform, which seems to be coming up quite often. Um, I saw a video uh, last night of, of him talking at a town hall in Milwaukee and a Native American protester, activist, got up there uh, for the final question when Bernie was literally just about walking out and he had to leave and everything like that. And the guy went on a bit of a rant, a bit of a long rant. I mean, the, the Native Americans feel they're not being heard at all. And in fact, none of the political parties seem to be talking about the Native American plight at all. So he was using his time and he was using it up. And Bernie was waiting, waiting, waiting to say something, but eventually he had to go. And the guy asked the question, are you going to honor treaties and things like that? And Bernie just said, I believe the Native American Indians have had a raw deal from the federal government and I will seek to address that. And that's all he said and then walked off. It's kind of ignoring it a little bit. The optics weren't terribly good, but then, I don't know, it's, it's one of those things, I'm sure you get these activists at every place you go to and they're all demanding an answer. Um, but it seems to be an Achilles heel because how he interacts with specific minorities still seems to be an issue. He doesn't have a prepared answer for these kinds of issues. But it's issues very hard to have a prepared statement for, for every, every minority. Situation. Exactly, exactly. However, he, he probably should have a way of dealing like that. Like, okay, 
that's an important question. I don't have time to address it right now. We need perhaps we can talk about this or something like that. Yeah, but you probably need the Rubio technique where you just. I mean, not necessarily the exact Rubio, but you know how Obama Rubio, has a plan. Yeah, you <laughs> shift over the... And the, he knows what he's doing. He probably needs something that sort of is universal for all those sort of um, specific minority issues. Where but you don't want it to sound on. like it's canned. It's just like, okay, I'm just flicking but, you off. I mean, because that's that's what that's what the optics are like. But, when, days, you, but so. when you're thinking about the, how this has been presented out in the media, you've only got time for bit pieces. So okay. But, if, all, if all you present at the moment is a one-sentence <coughs> blow-off, that's yeah, way worse but, than a canned... Um, Here's the problem. Position. Here's the problem. So Bernie's claiming to be the progressive in the campaign. That's that is he's very much owning that side of the trying to own that side of the debate. And a, a progressive, most progressives would say that any of these political revolutions have to be intersectional, which means you have to have an answer that addresses in a, in a generalized way, as you said, minorities. And he should have a better answer for well, it. Well, I mean, th- yeah, there you have it. He could yeah. probably lead into. I think the minorities in America have had a raw deal over the past thirty years. He doesn't have to necessarily address specifically Specific the ones, Native yeah. American issue. Because and as I said, so at the moment, I mean, this is one particular instance, and I don't know what the campaign's like. These guys are going to be doing incredible hours. Oh, crazy! And he'd hours. be doing one of these things. I've got to go, and then you're getting addressed, you're getting uh, getting a hard question from an activist who respects an answer, and and he well, just not, yeah. Not only is it a hard question, but it's a question that doesn't really resonate to mainstream America. So that's from a campaign position, that's problematic. That yeah. You can't really spend a lot of time preparing a specific answer to a Native American issue. That's not going to have a lot of currency. But as I said, he's he's claiming the progressive ground. He has to come to terms with these sorts of things. Yeah. So that's that's part of being a progressive is about. Yeah, look, he's he's willing to hear them, and and probably the best answer you can give is that you've you've been wronged in the past, and I will seek to address that. You have to remember that one thing's about Bernie is he he tries to tell people it's not just me, it's us. I can't do this on my own. I do like that 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 and, tagline and I think of theirs. He what? could have he could have done that with this as well. You know. Yeah. I will seek to address this, but you've got to remember it's not just me, it, yeah. it's us. We need everyone behind me so that we can achieve something. That fits in a lot with his branding about the whole idea is that they're meant to be building a movement because if they fully expected that they weren't going to get this far, they were meant to be building a movement up for an ongoing sort of political action and stuff mm. like that. I'm seeing similarities here between Bernie and Trump. Building a movement, building a wall. Then, uh-huh. Hey, the movement just got 10 feet higher. <laughs> you know who's paying for the movement? <laughs> Mexico. Rich assholes are paying for the movement. Rich assholes. <laughs> uh, and returning uh, to a discussion of rich assholes. Um, the resignation and retirements continue to mount in Canberra this week. First, we had Jamie Briggs and Melbra go. Uh, Stuart, oh. Stuart Robert has now been forced to resign after a uh, personal trip he took to China where certain delegates from China thought he was there in an official capacity while he was just there with his mate who owned Nimrod Resources and who he happened to have shares in, and he watched them sign a deal. Uh, he's he's also, gone. He was also involved in the bag full of Rolexes scandal. Yep, he's, he's gone. What? Uh, elaborate. Um, yeah, elaborate, a, please. A, a yeah. rather wealthy Chinese um, billionaire, I think he was made his fortune from instant noodles, um, came over to Australia and met with, um, at the time the coalition government was in opposition, so he met with Tony Abbott... Um, what was that chat? Stuart Robert. Stuart Robert and a few other coalition members where he pulled out a plastic bag full of Rolexes, which the these coalition MPs convinced themselves were fakes because they came in a plastic bag. Obviously. Only fake things come in plastic bags. Real things come in paper. And then so when they made their claims for those gifts, they reported them as being under five hundred dollars in value when apparently some of them were worth up to forty thousand dollars. Mm, Jeez. Whoa, 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 fake though. Forty thousand fake dollars. <laughs> uh, Andrew Robb has just stood down uh, after successfully signing the TPP for Australia. He has announced he intends to now work in the private sector in some capacity, um, which is nice. I imagine it's very difficult to accept kickbacks from corporate interest groups while you're still the minister. I- I'm not saying that's what he's doing. I'm just saying it would be difficult if you were. It'd be difficult. It's more efficient this way. Way more efficient. Way more efficient. And of course, Warren Truss has announced his retirement, which uh, paved the way for one Barnaby Joyce to rise to his new role as Deputy Prime Minister uh, and obviously the head of the National Party. Barnaby rises. Um, all of this has provided Turnbull with some uh, much needed, with a much needed opportunity for a bit of a cabinet reshuffle. Now when I think cabinet reshuffle, I'd like to think it sounds like this.
after hearing that song, I have the most uh, ridiculous image in my head of Malcolm Turnbull with a wooden spoon ch- chasing Tony Abbott sans pants around Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I'd like to think it's all a bit of a uh, game of musical chairs, uh, coalition musical chairs. So the good news, obviously, uh, that's coming out of all of this is that uh, Greg Hunt, uh, the best minister in the world, Australia's environment minister, he's safe. Also safe, Potato Dutton, Duff Brandis, Christopher Pine, Skomotion, Julie Bishop, they're all staying where they are. Boom. So how much of a shuffle are they having? Well, they, they've got rid of five people and they're just divvying up their treasures, the loot from that. Uh, so Fiona Nash has become the new deputy leader of the Nationals uh, and she, we're expecting to see her uh, ministerial role grow in accordance to that, which I think is, you know, this alone is worth highlighting. When Tony Abbott had his cabinet, Julie Bishop was the only woman on, on, in the cabinet. Malcolm's seeking to address that and people say he doesn't do anything. He does some things just slowly, okay? And to the Benny Hill theme <laughs> as he chases them around. Uh... Stephen Tiobo uh, has stepping, is stepping in to replace Andrew Robb as the Minister of Trade, which opens up his former role as the Minister for International Development and the Pacific to Conchetta Fiera of Fancy Wells. Very sorry I mumbled, got that name wrong. Uh, Matthias Corman nabs the Special Minister of State title from Melbra. Still not as special as Greg Hunt. <laughs> and Alan Tudge takes over as Minister for Human Services in light of Stuart Roberts' uh, resignation. Now, there are a couple of other little uh, changes around in the ranks. But uh, I think the most important thing here is Potato Dutton keeps his job again for a root vegetable. <laughs> that guy's doing all right. Now, as I've said on many episodes of The Bat, the Minister Skateco. for Immigration is untouchable. No one wants it. Ah, oh, just... I don't understand, right? I, I get... He must be part of some deal. Like, he's someone's illegitimate child that they have to protect or something. I don't understand why no, we keep him Nobody around. wants the job. Nobody wants that job. I guess he's protected because nobody else wants to go in there. He's not. Sh- he's too stupid to realize. And the damage what a is, he's already is. politically damaged. So what? The damage is done. Leave him there. Well, he's been left there, I guess, which is yeah. which is good. And Christopher Pine, little pod person that he is, has been quiet for such a long time now. He, he's just safe. What's he minister for now? Uh, he get minister for seeking to return Tony Abbott to the front bench, I believe, is uh, his most right. recent. Uh, Where is escapade. Tony? I know, it's weird, right? They've, they've done a reshuffle. Tony's not back. I'm sure Betts if he has was, mentioned to the, what any journalist will listen to him that Tony has the credentials, the experience to be on the yeah. front bench. In the secret ballot, someone, there's always one person that <laughs> always votes for Tony Abbott to come back in and they go, Eric, <laughs> would you cut that out? <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a good welcome back Cotter music theme that I could have gone with. Uh, would have served my uh, purposes for the day. Anyway, that's all I've got. Uh, that's... That's what's happening in Australian politics, which some don't think is as interesting as American politics. I don't. Sorry. That's fine. As I said, it's reality TV. It's like American is is, is like the super sugared up version of the soda that you just drink at locally. Like <laughs> it's just, it's it's horrendously bad for you. Well, I mean... It's just more entertaining. It, definitely the American politics at the moment is very entertaining in as much as that Republican candidates can say whatever nonsense they want and they're not called out upon it. Whereas, uh, I'm maybe deceiving myself here, is that Australian politicians sometimes get called out for saying stupid things. Although, recent behaviour of the Coalition Party would suggest they take us for fools. Well, Mitch Fifield uh, this week even called out a Labour MP for saying stupid things. Samantha something, I can't remember her name. I think, I think the reason I'm finding American politics so, uh, so engrossing at the moment is because you've got two non-establishment candidates that are making the establishment panic. And it's showing up. The cracks are showing. And, and they're having to take actions they normally wouldn't take. It's just exposing the inner workings of their politics a little more than usual. So it's, I wouldn't call Tony Abbott an establishment candidate when he, when he came to power. He was, he was pretty full of hate and vitriol. Yeah, that's the liberal base. So <laughs> I mean, our system's different in that the people don't get to nominate the candidate. That's right. It's not the same way. So, so the way the primaries, primaries work in America is you get the hardcore base of each party you trying try to sell to. Yeah. So, so the, the politics is very different, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway. Well, That's folks, fine. I think that brings us to uh, the end of another BAP edition. Um, thank you for listening. I've been Franco. I've been one cool fruity really knows where his towel is. Wow. It's episode 42, isn't it? Oh, what it I is. Say? It is. I get it now. I've been Dean. Sorry, if you have to explain the joke. <laughs> it's it's really no good. good. Oh, is this when I uh, <laughs> said the wrong... It, no, it was, coming full, it was coming full circle. Coming full circle. Yeah. Um, you set it up with the Hitchhiker's Guide at the beginning and I just closed it out. He just it closed it out. And shut it down. Oh my God, I, I am not... <laughs> this n- is a microphone drop worthy. moment. No, you're not. <laughs>
It took me a while to get it as well. He was just like, whoa, he's going for the really long name for himself. <laughs> anyway. Au revoir.